Welcome to another Gamma Partner Artist Feature interview. Today we speak with the one and only Michael Hufka. Hufka, who's really done it all, been creating since the 70s, digital art since the early 90s. He's been displayed in some of the biggest galleries and museums around the world, but talks deeply about his passion for the space, for culture, for supporting emerging artists and more. I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. Okay, very excited to have the man Hufka with us today. Really looking forward to this discussion. He's an artist that I was very well aware of and had, had admired much before he was a Gamma Partner artist. So I was excited, very excited when he became one. Uh, enough from me, Hufka, tell your story. You know, you've got so much experience in the space and out of this space. You have been, you know, dropping digital work, physical work. You're in many important galleries around the world. You can go as far back as you want and then tell your story right up until now. And then we'll keep having a chat, but welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Hey, Brett, thanks so much. Thank you, everybody out here who's watching. I'm Michael Hofka. I've been an artist for many, many years, about 50 years, actually. I'm, I'm trying to see if I can uh, show you a little bit around my studio. So actually, I'm going to move around a little and just show you where I work, what I've been doing. And basically, I started off as a traditional painter. This is an abstract painting. And we're going over to a painting that I worked on for the past eight years. I'm walking backwards so because I couldn't figure out how to reverse the camera on this program, StreamYard. But at any rate, uh, a little bit about myself. I'm an artist. I work in all sorts of visual mediums. I also use music. There's a painting that I just completed that's on my easel. I use music, animation. And since the 1990s, since 1994, I've always, I also worked in digital art. Um, so I work in any sort of uh, digital medium. Of course, nowadays, when you do an oil painting, you photograph it digitally. There's opportunities for changing it digitally. So I see myself as an artist that crosses all boundaries. I do show in museums around the world. I show in galleries from time to time. I have my own gallery in New York City also. So I'm very involved in both the trad art world and the NFT world, uh, world of Web3. And I really think it's awesome. It's international. Uh, we cross new borders uh, all the time. I'm very involved now in, in working with AI, AI in music, AI in visuals. And I mint my NFTs on Bitcoin blockchain and on Ethereum. I've done Solana. I'll, I'll go anywhere and everywhere to put my art out there. Let's fucking go. It's a brilliant introduction. And thank you for showing us around your studio. You mentioned that, yeah, you've really been creating since the early 90s. I know it's probably a bit it's of a loaded 70s. question. I've been, I've been well, creating. the 70s. Sorry, yeah. digital art since the 90s and then creating from a lot earlier. Let's go earlier. Like you said, the 70s. How did you get into becoming a creator? Where do you think that was born? Well, you know, as a child, I wanted to be creative. Uh, I My mother took me to a lot of museums. You know, a lot of the museums that I'm in, like the Met and the Museum of Modern Art, you know, my mother took me to. I admired art. She admired art. A lot of that stuff was really, truly inspiring. And actually, it was quite interesting because it wasn't as crowded or as popular back in those days. So I remember going to the Museum of Modern Art in, in, in the very old building and sitting in rooms all alone. I could, you know, contemplate on the paintings. And uh, it was a very personal experience. So for me, it was a very natural thing. I wanted to be an artist. And, uh, you know, I just followed my heart. And you mentioned that your mom, that's lovely as well, that she took you to those museums did she nurture that in you? Did she foster that love of art I and think, creativity in you? Yeah, I think so. My mother was very much into music and, and visual arts. And in the end, now that I'm 70 years old, I'm very involved in both. You know, so, uh, you know, I, I grew up on art and culture and 
It was very, very natural for me. And, you know, part of being an artist is engaging with the past, is understanding art history, uh, whether you're educated in school or whether you're self-taught like I am, you really engage with a lot of artists over a long period of time. And uh, it's kind of like a dialogue. So, uh, you know, I feel that I'm always in some sort of conversation, both with living artists and dead artists. It's really quite an exciting way to live as far as I'm concerned, or, or it was just meant for me. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting because obviously observing you and we haven't met in person yet, but you, you're you very passionate and you really do, I guess, like portray that that connection and collaboration and trying to connect with people. So it seems that people have been very important, but I want to wind back a little bit further. I remember you telling a little story about what you did create digitally in the early 90s and how people weren't interested in it then. How, yeah. how has that evolved to now a world of digital art? Well, you know, that was very, it was a very natural start for me to get involved in digital art. My, my children were very young. Uh, it was the beginning of desktop publishing. And, and I had several books published already by conventional publishers. So I was already fascinated with this whole uh, emergence of desktop publishing. But at any rate, you know, like all parents, I bought a computer basically, so that my kids would be computer savvy. And, you know, I started uh, drawing on computers to play with them. And, uh, you know, it was quite in my, you know, I remember one of my sons got obsessed with Photoshop, you know, uh, the not the first version, the version three, it was 3.0 at the time when I started, you know, there was a painter, I think it was 1.0, you know, so a lot of that was really extraordinary. I was very excited about it. And I really did feel digital art was going to become part of the trad art world that I was already in. So I did publish a book of uh, digital paintings, and I did print a lot of digital paintings. And I showed them to all the dealers I were wor I was working with. But they were, it was a very... Uh, you know, negative reception. Uh, dealers wanted uh, traditional art from me. They wanted traditional prints like etchings. Um, you know, etchings is a very physical form of printmaking, very different than digital. Actually, I'm going to walk over in my studio now to my etching press. I still, you know, I still do etchings. I still, I do like old fashioned medium still. So I could show you here is an etching press. It's kind of a very cool machine. It's very different than digital. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting. I, I personally like all mediums. So, um, you know, that's why I got excited about digital art to begin with. However, there was no uh, real welcoming for digital art. So actually what happened is at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, um, what happened really was showing, uh, you, I, I was touring a lot as a musician uh, with my band Feeding Goats, which was myself and my wife, Yanat, and, and a lot of other musicians. We'd have guest musicians, and we played out a lot, but that shut down. And so did also showing in galleries. Like, everything just stopped at the pandemic. And at that point, I found out that there was a burgeoning market. Actually, I missed the first wave of NFTs. I had not heard about it at all because I was very, very busy in the traditional art world. However, when the pandemic happened, you know, I found out about that. I was very curious about crypto and I just said, you know, let's fucking go and got involved. It was very easy transition for me. You know, uh, you have to figure out, and to this day, sometimes artists ask me, how do you get involved? You get on Twitter and then you get on Twitter or X, as it's now known, and uh, Crypto X, and you just observe what other people are doing. And actually, what I realized very early on is that it's a community and that there are real people out here. Some are helpful, some are not. Some really stick to themselves or they're competitive and they don't really want to help you. And that's Unfortunate, but that's also very similar to the trad art world that exists in every business, that exists in every art form. So, I, you know, that didn't deter me. 
there were enough helpful people and there were people that talked to me. And actually, I was kind of welcomed. Um, I was welcomed mostly by unknown artists. Uh, of course, I think more known artists might have experienced me as coming in from the world that they weren't accepted in. I was in museums, they weren't. So there was a bit of friction there. But the unknown artist really absolutely welcomed me into this ecosystem. And, you know, they wanted to grow and I started exploring it. And I was just very thrilled at the idea that I could make digital art. But what was more most exciting about that is that I could combine all of my interests. I could make, I could take a traditional painting, I could cut it up, I could animate it digitally, I could add my music. All that stuff really just blew my mind because I, I like playing around, I like experimenting, I like new mediums. When I discovered uh, the, you know, that AI, that that fascinates me and. You know, it isn't what people say it is. You go, every time you find out about something, go one level deeper, and there's a lot of things that are quite interesting and unique and new about it. So uh, it was a whole natural transition for me. It's really interesting that it was a natural transition for you because it's still, maybe it still just feels like, and it's not that there is still a divide between, say, like trad art and the new digital art world. Where do you think that's heading or have you seen it, I guess, integrate further over your journey? No, uh, unfortunately, there is a divide. And uh, one of, you know, my pet peeves is when, when um, you know, royalties were cut out of the NFT ecosystem. And, and I know Gamma uh, likes royalties and, and protects royalties. And this is really an extraordinary thing. So, you know, I don't want to get into the whole discussion about royalties because mm. people are tired about hearing of it. But actually, it, it did a terrible thing. It discouraged new artists from coming into the ecosystem. And new artists also bring uh, new collectors. So actually, it just it's devastating. I, I still feel uh, that this was a, a tragic mistake. I hope this changes. I hope the platforms see the downturn in business because there definitely has been a downturn in business and rectify it. You know, there are different formats. Like, for example, royalties could be a smaller amount, 5% or 10% on profits, only on profits. They don't have to be that if you buy something and lose money and sell it, you have to pay royalties. This whole thing was killed in a very, very problematic way. Now, going back to the trad art world, I, I have to say that artists do not become artists just to make money. This is, you know, you become a plumber to make money. You become an upholsterer to make money, an engineer, or, you know, who knows, many different things. Perhaps, you know, you could say a physician becomes a physician to heal people. There's an idealistic aspect to becoming an artist, just like there is to the healthcare workers. Now, the, the interesting thing about that is that there's also aesthetics involved. You want to go into something that is, is hip, that is with it, that people see as the new avant-garde, as something that is really kind of sexy for the future. So if you're going to get young artists into NFTs, it can't be an old dead thing. And unfortunately, what I do see the trend now is for lots of people to say to me, well, crypto's back, but NFTs are dead. I see this all the time from art dealers that are friends of mine that I talk to in the trad art world, from young artists who choose simply not to go into NFTs. Now, I normally don't really want to discuss this negative aspect of our culture, but I think if we open this up for discussion, there perhaps might be different attitudes in the NFT community that helps change this and welcome new artists because we definitely need new artists and new collectors. It can't be the same old folks. And it can't just be me saying, wow, this is the future. This is great. Let's fucking go while it dies. That won't work. Mm. No, I think that's really well said. To touch on how you have created traditionally and then you use that work 
and and let's just use the word remix. It's not quite the right word, but remix right. it, do different things with it digitally. How has that been for you as a creator and uh, I guess like exploring different possibilities? Well, that's a great question. That's a, that's actually an extra, uh, it's a feature of me being older, having worked for 50 years. So, you know, when I wake up in the morning, I have a choice. I could look at old work of mine and do something with it. You know, if I want to work, I could just pick up my iPad, work on Procreate or go to a screen, you know, and, and draw on my tablet and work in Photoshop. I could work digitally. So I have a lot of choices. And part of that choice is the huge inventory and library of work that I've created over the years. So I like looking back. I like taking works. Uh, actually, I just did this, you know, just yesterday. I'll give you an example. So Gamma is doing this uh, play deck of cards, you know, which I'm very excited about. I was invited to do one of the cards. I'm doing the Joker. So I took an image of mine uh, of a, the Joker from Batman that I actually painted and I made it into the Joker card in this deck. So, you know, the fact is I do have an inventory of old work that, you know, in my mind exists forever. So I like to go forward. I like to go backward at the same time. Uh, you know, that might not be relevant to a lot of young artists who are only going forward. I was there at that point, too. I never looked back. I just wanted to keep going. So I think, you know, we're in an ecosystem where it could be done any number of ways. This just happens to be my way. For sure. And like you said, you obviously have such a large breadth of work. Have you found, has your style or the way you create evolved or have you had, has there been a cohesive thread? I know some artists will try lots of things and then others are quite, you know, their work is all quite noticeably say like, that's definitely by Hafka. How has that been for you? Well, my work is very recognizable, yet I change all the time and I like experimenting. And I, I found that, you know, one of the traps in the art world, whether it's this art world, Web3, or whether it's the trad art world uh, in galleries, is that, you know, an artist generally has to establish a brand and a style. You know, like if you're a figurative expressionist art, artist you can't do realism you can't do photography you can't do abstract painting i actually um i have a lot of experience i've sold a lot of work to everybody people come into my studio even into my gallery because i keep a gallery too and you know people look at all the different things i do and they get turned on by them so i haven't had to limit myself i have a lot of fun i'm in it for the fun I'm in it to experiment and play around. I've been lucky that the thing that I love to do and have fun has always supported me. Uh, that's a pretty incredible thing, and I'm very, very grateful for it. So I, I, I'm not a great believer in limiting your style. I'm not a great believer in um, doing anything for the market. Just do it for yourself, and there, a market will come. I think that that's really pertinent advice. And I think you don't have to elaborate too much more, but have you found that that authenticity does really help? And have you seen it help others? Or is that the sort of advice you give? Well, that's the advice I give. Uh, and really, you know, I found that I was able to just, I, I became an artist to be free. You know, there are many ways you can live your life. You can do anything and everything. And there are usually limitations because they involve other people. Being an artist, you're really, really independent. You can do whatever the hell you want. And that's why I became an artist. I wanted to express myself, create something that I got off on, that I thought was cool, that I just think, wow, this is really necessary. And, you know, I, I didn't never really care what anybody else thinks. Now, that is not a suicidal position. The world is huge. You can make something and, and 5 billion people can tell you that it sucks. But if there's one person that likes it in this great big world and who wants to buy it, you're a working artist. So who cares? I started selling art on the streets of New York, literally peddling. And that was my experience. You just stand there long enough. Someone comes along and says, hey, how much is that? I want it. And, you know, you might as well live free. 
I, yeah, and that, that leads me to a question that I do like to ask and we'll hit on it now. When you create, do you, how, I guess maybe this, this journey's evolved for you as well, but where, how do you know, how do you know that you're happy with it? And then how do you feel when you're putting it out to the public in the physical world or the digital world for sale? Is it, do you get nervous still or is, have you evolved past that? I know that different artists feel different ways. Well, you're asking two questions, okay? How do I feel when I'm making the art? I feel great. It's the best thing in the world. It's absolutely a lot of fun. And I just am having a great time. And how do I know when it's finished? It's just a a feeling of, wow, this is incredible. It just blows my mind or, you know, really talks to me. It's something different, you know? So uh, it's kind of a sensual realization that you have it's a very much uh, uh an exciting um beautiful sometimes mind-blowing experience you're it's all about oh wow you feel energized and you feel energetic now about putting it out in the world you know uh, yeah you could you could be insecure you could think well you know i love it but will other people love it but i've learned to like kind of ignore that and i've learned that you have no control you just have no control you could put out a piece and everybody's attention is is in something else um and so the piece doesn't do well you know i had a, an incredible show once in new york city and uh the opening was um on on a tuesday in uh, a Soho gallery. It was a phenomenal show. It was really big. There was a catalog. Everybody was supporting it. And, you know, Monday, the stock market crashed. It was Black Monday, you know. So the opening to my show, you know, it was like a funeral. You know, there were people walking around, but they they looked like they had just been shot. They were shell-shocked. So all the big collectors in New York were stunned. They were walking around my show, you know, like, hopelessly upset insecure about everything the show didn't sell during the opening at all it was it was really like kind of like a very funny experience but it taught me you know really that no matter what you do you've got no control you've got to let go of control it is hard to let go of control but ultimately we don't have control about a lot of things in life as an artist you really learn that learn that It's part of the practice, actually, to lose control. That's why I always say, let's fucking go. It's really kind of like my my attitude. You just got to let go. You just got to go forward. You got to lose control. I'm not into the kind of art, and this is personal. All artists could do what they want, and anything is really possible in art. You know, I don't look back at the history of art, calculate, well, you know, these kind of paintings, they're pretty. These are flowers. You know, everybody's going to love them, you know, make flowers. To me, that's kind of a prison. So I try to do something that's really, in my mind, completely new, taking a leap. And if it's not well received, you know, I'm 70 years old. I can I can coast for the rest of my life. I can do whatever I want. But I had that attitude when I was 30. I think it's it's fun to live that way. Let's fucking go. No, again, I you know, per, really I think pertinent advice once again, but also telling it through your story. And you you touched on her before, and I've met her through my journey, you know, like working with you and 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 getting to know you. You're not your nut must be a very important person in this whole journey. And I've got another question to ask after that. But yeah, tell tell me tell me about her. Just she's your wife. You know, she's clearly your best friend from what I've seen from all the photos. But her part in your, I keep using the word journey, but just your life as an artist. Well, I, I love you not. You know, that's my wife. Yeah. You're not my muse. You know, that's my best friend. You know, that's everything to me. And I have to say, you can't do things alone in life. Mm. You need a partner. Uh, I, I don't like giving love advice to everybody uh, because, you know, some people like to be loners and everybody has different kinds of relationships. But I found that when I became an artist uh, and, and you and I have been together since the very beginning, she, her support for me was just absolutely total. Do what you want. 
be who you want to be. And we lived our life like that. We grew up three children uh, like that. We were we had very, very tough times. But throughout all of those tough times, we're really we really always had each other. Um you know, we had very no luxury. There were we were very, very poor and we struggled a lot of times financially. I went up and down all the time. It was feast or famine. I would go into phenomenal debt. Uh, I sold to the biggest collectors in the world and then to nobody. So, you know, I lived the real uh, uh, hardcore, brutal artist's existence. You not helped me at every stage. At every stage, she believed in me. This is something, that's why I'm so pro-artist, and that's why I try to be uh, supportive of all young artists, of all unknown artists. Um, you know, the reason is, is that the one thing artists need is support. Uh, artists, it's a very fragile situation when you believe in what you create. You create something, it's very unusual and it's new. Um, it's not like other products. Other products are tested. You know, if you make a car, you test the car. You know, everything out there normally that we consume is tested and it's practical. And it, the reason it goes into the market is because it passes certain significant tests. Of course, it still could fail, but some form of it, some variation, another form of a car is going to be made. But with art, if you, if you do something, if you look at an artist from the past and copy it, or if you copy themes from the past and, you know, like, as I said, you know, pretty flowers always sell. Well, it's true. But I, I don't see that so much as an artist's life. I see that as another for another business life. You're you're selling decoration. That's fine. That's what you one chooses to do. My position is if you want to be really creative, you need love and support. You're not gave me all the love and support. And honestly, I hope every artist finds their muse, finds their real love and support in life and and just goes forward doing whatever they want to do yeah totally and to ask a follow-up question do you think have those experiences come through in what you create i think all creation is love i mm. think even you know when people look at you know my most difficult paintings or my my most frightening paintings that are about human history uh paintings that you know have a message of how fragile our existence are it wouldn't have been made without the love I received. It wouldn't have been made without the love that I'm giving it. You know, art is a form of loving everyone. It's a form of hugging everyone. It's a form of connecting with everyone uh, in a very, very pure way. I don't connect with everybody because I want people to like buy my work. I connect with everybody because I'm making something that I feel is essential to save the world. Now, maybe I'm a little deluded. Maybe all artists are a little deluded. We see beauty in the universe and we're trying to make the universe better, more beautiful, heal it. I think that's what Van Gogh's mission was. Um, I, I think a lot of artists, you know, focus on that. Um, and I think just go forward, invent something that changes the way people see the world and makes the world better. Mm. And to, to then let's have a look at some of what you've put on Bitcoin. But before sure. we do that, before we do that, you, you've made a couple of really interesting points, which I want you to start with. You showed us your the the etching machine and you really are etching your work or writing your work onto bitcoin yeah and then you also talked about that um the the book that you had published on digital prints and one of your your uh ordinals one of your inscriptions on bitcoin that's right was, it, was very first, your earliest yeah so let's look very at that first digital work you robos uh i'm very proud of that that's i put that intentionally on bitcoin um, because, you know, I, you know, I felt it it really, yeah, it's, to me, I love that work. It was one of my very, very first digital works. I think it was the first digital work I ever made. So, you know, I'm, you know, 
and, and about etching and inscribing, it's actually a good thing that you, you bring that up. So an etching plate is so real because it, it is permanent. When you, in fact, when you finish an edition, the way you cancel a plate is you, you carve, you inscribe it with a big X or you put X's in the, you put lines in the corners. So, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of, you know, the first immutable, you know, it's carved in, in copper. Sometimes, you know, it's steel faced. So, you know, I, I, I went naturally from that form of printing. There's all sorts of other forms of printing, you know, um, I, I personally love etching the best because I, I think it's the, the really, the, most physical, the realist in a certain sense, because it's inscribed into the plate. And I, and I love the machine. I love uh, the etching press itself. You know, I think about that often when I, you know, hopefully I'll live many, many more years. So when I'm a hundred years old and I'll want to etch, I'm going to have to mo have a motorized press. I don't know if I'll be able to turn the crank, but I still exercise a lot and I can turn the crank. You're certainly a very uh, fit and energetic guy, so I'm not, I, I wouldn't be I surprised. I try to work out, you know? Yeah. I'm so, inspired by all the young people, you know, working out all the time. So I try to do the same. In, in one of I'll, my Bitcoin pieces, you could see the kettlebell, you know? You yeah. Let, let's, the kettlebell I work let, out with. So, yeah, scroll down. Yep. Pepe there, lifts. Yeah. Yeah. There. That's right. There it is. There's kettlebell. Hold on. Go and, go and get it. There it is. See, that's the bell. See, that's proof of work. Like, yeah, Bitcoin. that's there proof we go. of work. We inscribed it. You know, I love that. I love that. And and again, that's some of your real experience coming out in your work. And it, it's funny that we say it. You know, it's for a reason. But there's those parallels between your etching and then writing your work onto Bitcoin. So, you know, how has that experience been for you? We've got. We can see a number of these originals. There's your kettlebell again. Yeah. Um, yeah. That you've put on and you've sold prints and editions with yeah. you know from some of these pieces yeah uh, you know you've released a lot of work on eth and and now you're putting that work onto bitcoin how has that been for you i, I suppose just uh, as a motivator in terms of what you pick or what you create has it does it um influence what you do and what you decide to put onto bitcoin well it doesn't influence the actual output and the work that i do nothing you know, um, nothing about where you show, whether it's a gallery or whether it's on Gamma or whether or which blockchain I choose really actually influences the work. But I will say as an artist that shows in galleries and showed for many, many years, like, for example, when you show in a gallery in Soho, you know, the show is up for 30 days or 28 days, and people can only walk into that calorie, you know, from 10 in the morning till six in the evening. It's a very limited thing. So the moment I found out about the blockchain, you know, I realized, wow, 24 seven, I can put art, art there, I put art out there. People can get it any time of the day, anywhere in the world. That blew my mind. So, you know, uh, I, I don't really make so much of a distinction between these art worlds. The benefits are obvious. So I, I just think everybody should be putting art out on the blockchain. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And let's also now switch across and have a look at some of the prints that you've put out. And we'll get you to talk about sure them perhaps in a little bit more detail. So let me just find them here. I don't know if I have any details to offer. You know, I'm well, very much, we'll go on. Yeah, we'll go on. You know, honestly, my feeling about my work is I intentionally try to make something that's a visceral feeling mm. that the uh, that the the viewer can experience in many different ways and in their own personal way. So when I look at Captain Hook, I don't want to tell you who's Captain Hook in my life. Yes. I don't want to like say, I don't want to ruin it for you. You know, mm. I, I played Peter Pan when I was a kid and, you know, Captain Hook was in the play. But, you know, if I go into details about my interpretations of the work, I actually literally ruin it for the mm. viewer. So I'm very conscious not to do that. It's not just my preference. 
I just I, I just don't feel it's right. I give certain kind of hints. You know, the Cretan bull. It's a mythological subject. People can look it up. But if you if you look at the image, you could see that this image can go in many different ways in terms of mood and in terms of what you experience. And I, I expect that to last, you know, for eternity. I want people in a hundred years to look at this and have an have an interpretation that's based on who they are in their time. So I, I do believe that art has to be suggestive in a mysterious way. The other thing that I want to point out is this is not verbal. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not a writer. I'm not a, a poet. So I'm a visual artist and visual art does not work with words. It's essentially abstract, just like music. You know, you don't create a composition, you know, and, and then play the music and tell people, well, this is about this or that, you know, um, you know, it's kind of cheesy. It's kind of limiting. And I think it ruins art for everybody. I, I, I understand there's a little bit of ins insecurity on the part of the viewer they walk into the room and they walk into a gallery. Most people are not artists. So when they go into a gallery, for example, it's an unusual situation to begin with. They're in a different element. And so they're wondering, what the hell is this thing about? But when, when someone suggests an interpretation, they're actually betraying the actual medium. I don't think that I should be doing that. Yeah, no, it's, I think it's that's an object. This is a hammer. But if it were a work of sculpture, you wouldn't say this is a hammer. I think that that's really well put. What about the naming of your art then? So, for example, the devil is in the details and you chose to release that just prior to the Bitcoin halving. That was really cool. There must have been, again, you don't have to ruin yeah, it, but I'm, I'm playing like you games. say, but there must have been a thought process behind it. Absolutely. I, I play games with the audience. I play games with myself. You know, mm. part of being an artist is a performance. There's a performative yeah. quality to the whole thing. So, you know, a lot of it is just having fun. So, you know, I look at a picture and, you know, that I made and, you know, I give it my suggestions and my interpretations. It was right before the halving. So the devil is in the details. The picture has a devilish quality to it. You know, so and actually, you know, that's that's true about art. The devil's in the details. You could take, you know, if you if you use words to look at this picture and say, well, this is the subject. It's this vague devil with horns. Well, it could come out visually in a million different ways. Some of those ways would just be lousy art, lousy drawing. So the devil is in the details with art. It's got to evoke something. There's got to be magic to the way an artwork is made. It's not just a rendering of reality. It's a rendering of an emotional reality. It's a rendering of some creative impulse deep within us. If it's just an illustration, that's pretty weak. That doesn't cross over all that quickly to being art. It's just kind of, kind of lame. And it's interesting that you say that. So as a as an artist, but I suppose as you know, somebody who's seen a lot of art and perhaps um, critiqued a lot of art or thought about a lot of art, what speaks to you? Something that just shows me something new inside myself. You know, I'm I'm pretty visceral. You know, if I if I go if I go into a museum or go into a gallery or I see something online. You know, I, I don't want to see, I want to, I want to be moved. I want to, I want to be emotionally engaged. Uh, I don't want to think it's clever. I don't want to think, oh, this is skilled. None of those things really mean anything to me. You know, uh, being slick isn't really, uh, you know, there's, you know, you can use music as an example. You know, when you hear a good pianist or a good guitar player and they, they play technically really well. It doesn't really mean anything. When someone plays, whether they're technically good or not, and they somehow move your heartstrings, that's what we want from art. That's what we want from music. So, um, you know, I, I think 
people should really get back to that basic impulse of experiencing magic, uh, experiencing, this is the magic we really can experience. This is the religion of the moment. Yeah, I don't want to be critical of concepts like religion. Religion used to be more pervasive in all cultures. It was something that people believed in with all the depth of their heart. You know, I think that's waned in modern culture. Science has become a kind of religion of some sort, but science is all about experimenting with the unknown, having uh, an idea of something, trying to prove it, disproving it. You know, there's nothing, there's no facts to science. You know, in art, actually, we can have a real true religion that hurts no one. It's something that moves us for what, for better or for worse, all we have is the present, who we are deeply inside. We can be deeply moved emotionally by a work of art. Uh, why waste it with decorative crap? Mm. And you you mentioned music in that in that dialogue there and you you play music and you said you in a band and with your nut have have your visual art and your let's just define them as different the visual art and the musical music is an art do they cross over or do, do you I, listen to music when you create or tell us about how they may or may not interact with each other in your life well they you know they're different um i don't really know how to answer that about do I listen to music when I paint? Yeah, lots of times. Miles Davis. I've lived, you know, for many, many years, every painting of mine, every single painting was painted to Miles Davis. And, you know, a lot of jazz, you know, I used to go to a lot of concerts. Uh, how do I feel about music? You know, I play music and it takes me to a new space all the time. It's deeply meditative and, you know, it, I'm looking, I, you know, it's something that I relax in. It's something that like expands me. It's something I learn from all the time. And so, you know, I make music and then I integrate it into the visual art when I make an animation. Um, you know, so I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't judge it. I don't know what to say. You know, I experience it this, I experience it so very much the same as my visual art. It is what comes out of me, except in this case, generally it's me and you're not. Most of the time, it's not just solo guitar or solo piano. It's you're not on Thurman. So that adds another beautiful element to it because a lot of times, uh, and you could hear this in our music, I'm playing to her, she's playing to me. It's another form of making love. It's another form of communication. And, you know, I bring that into uh, my paintings, too. And, you know, now, you know, I don't listen to Miles as much. I listen to a lot of my own music because, you know, when you make music, you, you have to listen to it over and over again in the process of editing it and all that. But, um, you know, I, I, I see it all as kind of one thing. This is who I am alive right now. When I'm no longer here, when I die, I will cease to exist as making this stuff. This stuff will be what's left of me. It is me. So it's kind of a deep uh, religious feeling I have about art. Yeah, and that's really interesting. And without sounding too cliche, getting that work onto Bitcoin, then preserving it and allowing that longevity for the art is, I think, must be a really fascinating thing as an artist and i love that you said it's another way of making love i've always seen it as yeah like a bit of a dance it's like looking at a piece of art is almost a dance between the artist and the viewer as well uh i've, yeah, I've I got want, to, i yeah, want to go say on. one thing about getting it on bitcoin I, I love that and i think it's permanent and i think it proves providence and that's always been a big problem in the industry of making mm -hmm. art and there are tons of forgeries and people fake things uh, you know, I've been presented with fakes of my own. People make, fa you know, uh, people have come to me and said, well, I bought this Hafka, you know, and, uh, you know, it's not signed or or can you verify this? Because sometimes it's signed and it, it wasn't mine. So, you know, this is a real problem. My only complaint about that is that 
partly because of the market, we don't mint everything. Everything should be minted. Provenance would be reassured. So it'd be great if everything is on the blockchain. I would be really in favor of that. Yeah, and that that is a really interesting and sad thing about art fraud and things like that in real life. Let, we don't have to go into too much detail there, but when that occurred, how was that experience? Oh, you know, that happens many times. I mean, people just email you a photo. You know, people create forgeries. So that's happened in my lifetime several times. You know, somebody would send me a picture and say, you know, like, uh, can you verify this is yours? And it's not mine, you know, sorry. And, and I always kept really extraordinarily complete records. You know, generally everything throughout all of these years that I made was photographed in four by five transparencies and scanned. So I have really, really great records. There have been uh, times where, you know, like I made a piece, I didn't get to photograph it and sold, you know, I didn't stop sales and say, wait, I can't, you can't buy it because it's got to be photographed. So, you know, I had shows and things were sold that I didn't get photographs of. And sometimes th stuff was sold and then uh, a a photograph was sent to me by another dealer or by, you know, a collector. So, you know, that didn't happen frequently, but, you know, you do, it's very hard to keep track of everything perfectly. You know, that's a challenge. The blockchain really could uh, alleviate that permanently. Mm, no, well said. Have you ever created something that you has been too personal or you've loved it too much and you, you know, you, you're, I can't sell this. I need to yeah, keep this in. I, absolutely. Yeah. I've collected a lot of my own work. Um, you know, as an artist, you you make, I do anyway, make a lot more than I can sell. So all through the years, you know, I've kept a lot of work. I keep works for my children, you know, and even now in, in NFTs, you know, when I make NFTs, I'll, I'll make, uh, uh, if it's an addition, you know, I keep several for my kids and grandkids. You know, so, uh, yeah, I love my work and I and I keep a lot of it for myself. And I'm glad that you just mentioned the word additions because I it's a nice segue. I wanted to bring up Pepe Liv. See, that was a yeah. set of additions. I've got a gloat. I own the original, so that's not going anywhere. But that's great. Um, that was, you know, a, a real blessing. And, I, you know, one of my favorite pieces that, I, that I've ever owned now. But um Thank you. I, I really loved getting Pepe on Bitcoin in this form. You know, I, I've done it on Counterparty, but, you know, to me, this was a great opportunity, uh, you know, to uh, mint on, on the blockchain. And I, I think it's an extraordinary piece. I, it's, it's mimetic. It really speaks to the community and it's really about Web3. And I'm proud of how I painted it digitally. No, I couldn't agree more. And that that is a beautiful start to just that question about Pepe, but then beyond Pepe, just that, like you said, that Web3 culture, that, that must have, like, it's clearly been a very positive influence on you. Can you just touch on, on culture and then sure. how it's like weaved into this? Absolutely. I, I really love that. That's a subject I really, really love. You see, in the trad art world, uh, there were never, in, in my time, there weren't any genuine movements that were created by artists. The whole neo-expressionism thing that I was part of was not created by artists. It was created, the terminology was created by critics, by dealers. You know, this was a selling tool and it was a kind of a cynical imitation of the avant-garde. So when I came into Web3 and seeing Pepe culture, that's a genuine culture. You know, there are genuine, there are so many people that are into Pepe. This is not created by commerce. It was created by a genuine love of Pepe, shifting Pepe around, you know. And just in general, in the Web3 ecosystem, I do feel that so much of the art is really uh, really genuinely, whether it's good or bad, it's genuinely not cynical. It's genuinely about art made by artists. So it is a culture. It's very different than the sort of gallery world. Because if you think about the trad art world, you know, artists are one part of it. Galleries, and there's many of them, are another part of it. They determine the culture just as much as the artists. So it's not really 
art uh, culture determined by artists. I, I find, you know, uh, I could work with that. That's perfectly fine. You know, um, you know, the days of the avant-garde have long since disappeared. Um, you know, after World War II, after abstract expressionism, you know, there was a downhill slide um, in terms of artists creating. It was mostly, you know, I, I think commerce creating. But, you know, I, I experience it a little different in Web3. Um, so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, there's hope. Yeah. And I think that that's a really uh, great place to sort of start to finish up uh, that, you know, you've brought up so many interesting topics, but saying, yeah, that there's hope and it really is driven by the artists and then linking to royalties. And, you know, like you said, let's fucking go, like letting go and, you know, be, you know, really being your authentic self. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, to just have this deep dive. I wish, you know, we could keep going, but you know, Hafka, thank you so much. And we look forward to what, else, you know, whatever else you're going to bring, but thank you for just being part of it and being a partner artist. Uh, is there anything else that maybe we didn't touch on that you'd like to share? Otherwise, yeah, thank you so much. This was a really great discussion. Real, really, I, I can't think of anything else. I, I'm very positive. Um, I, I hope that on, on some level, um, you know, what I look, towards is the unknown, the unknown in me, the unknown new work that I'm going to make. And I hope there are artists that I haven't seen yet that come out. I think we very much need new artists coming into this ecosystem. New collectors will come. And I hope I inspire artists to give it a try and to uh, go forward. It, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best technology for getting your art out in the world today. Thank yeah, you. And let's fucking go. Let's fucking go. And let me just say, Hafka, you definitely are an inspiration to collectors. You know, I'm a collector, but I also work at Gamma to artists. I can assure you of that. So keep um, being yourself. You. And yeah, it's a pleasure uh, to be involved with you. Thank you very much.